to the well, last couple of months, really, as we've um, this is our third um, combined um, pastors event, um, and it's a joy to work together. And so, uh, in a moment, I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how that's all uh, going to uh, unpack. But it's uh, simply format simple. I just want to um, talk a little bit about Willow, and then um, we're going to I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Bob and interview him. They are recording me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this lunch has been sponsored uh, by Family First and Willow together, and uh, it, once again, it's a joy to have you here. And in the event, in the unlikely event of an emergency, follow David, and all, and all will be well. Um, so, with Willow, we, um, over the last six years that I've been in the executive director's role, um, we have... Uh, developed the ministry uh, quite substantially and quite differently, actually, to um, many of the other countries that uh, Willow was in now, which is actually 130 this year. So we have about 65 countries to go, and uh, it's Bill Hybels' goal to be in all countries of the world before he uh, finishes his race. So uh, some of those countries are, don't even have a church in them, so that's going to be interesting. But... Um, we are very committed with uh, what we do these days in terms of professional development. So our, our, our focus is the local church and leaders in the local church, pastors and ministry leaders. We also have a growing focus with our Christians who are leading in the marketplace in education, social services, health, etc., and business, um, which is a, a thrill. But that is almost like a secondary uh, focus for us. Our primary focus is still the local church. We're champions for the local church. And... Um, really believe that when the local church is working well, then um, everybody is blessed. Both. What Willow Academy is, is distinct from Willow Leadership, is that Willow Leadership is leadership. So the Global Leadership Summit, and uh, there's a flyer on, the, um, on your um, chairs about that. That's coming up. It's going to be at Bethlehem Baptist um, in uh, October. So that's, that's our flagship event, and we do that every year, and, and that's our, the, one of a number of leadership events we do. But Willow Academy is about bringing issues of the day to pastors and ministry leaders and Christians generally to inform them, to brief them about some of the complex issues of our day, uh, the ones that are controversial, the ones that are difficult to understand, the ones that are difficult to get a handle on. And so uh, increasingly, as I've met pastors across the denominational spectrum, they've been struggling with how do they make a Christian response to the complex issues of our day, which is actually the, the motivation for me making, uh, Bob and I getting, uh, working together a bit more. So this is one of those. This is a Willow briefing. For example, in two weeks' time in Hamilton, we're going to do one on climate change. And it's interesting to me, for example, with climate change, that it's probably a more contestable issue with Christians than it is with non-Christians. Most non-Christians I've discovered and what I read have pretty much agreed that man-made climate change is a reality. But Christians are contesting it still. So, um, yeah, and I know you are, and you're wrong. But, um, <laughs> um, but, but, um, <laughs> but we've got a scientist, a uh, Christian scientist, who... Um, we got a Christian scientist who's going to present a, a, a one-hour briefing. He was the, the scientist that did the science, if you followed this at all, for Jan Andrews, Dr. Jan Andrews' report, which went to the Prime Minister, which has now become, is now forming part of the legislation for local governments and so on. So, uh, so that's another example of a Willow Academy, and we call that a briefing. So... Um, Coming up here in Tauranga, just a couple of things and then I'm finished. So it's the Global Leadership Summit in November. How many of you have heard of Carl Fays and Olive Tree Media from Sydney, Australia? So Carl's going to be back here in Tauranga, uh, this time with a new series, fabulous series called Jesus the Game Changer. So he's done this fabulous work, he's interviewed, I think, some, something like 40 different people, experts from around the world. And the whole focus of Jesus the Game Changer is looking at the influence that Jesus has had on Western culture and Western civilization. So it's a curriculum, it's really good. And so some of you have uh, worked with his first curriculum, which was Towards Belief. This is his second one. And we're going to be uh, in uh, Tauranga here. I think it's uh, early November. It's on our website. And then the other 
event that's coming up in March next year. For the first time ever, we're going to have some of Andy Stanley's people here in New Zealand that I'm hosting in Auckland for a two-day conference called Further Faster. There's a card on your chair about that. Um, what we're going to explore together with these three people that are coming out from um, North Point uh, Community Church is how to create churches. So Andy Stanley's, uh, the, the North Point Christian, sorry, North Point Community Church's mm -hmm. vision statement is how to create churches that unchurched people love to come to. So we're going to explore that and uh, dig deeply into his book, Deep and Wide. And coming with the... the in the team of three coming out is Lane Jones, who was one of the guys, one of six that started that church 25 years ago. So our website is willowcreek.org.nz and all the details and registration facility is on our website. But here is just a little trailer for our Global Leadership Summit. Thanks. Leadership is hard work. If you aren't actively cultivating yourself as a leader, chances are you're losing ground. You may not even be aware of it, but the people around you can feel it, and your team can feel it as well. Your leadership cannot stay here. You've got to move yourself toward there. Several years back, I found myself in a leadership slump. Slumps happen, you know. Managers get into slumps. Teams get into slumps. Leaders get into slumps too, and I was in a slump. And it took intentionality on my part to move myself out of the slump into a better place. That's why my team and I make it a priority every year to be actively engaged with the Global Leadership Summit. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the summit is a two-day infusion of vision, inspiration, and practical skills so that you can take your leadership from here to there. I'm very excited about the diverse faculty joining us at this year's summit. They bring a blend of high challenge ideas and fresh perspectives that will invigorate your leadership and provide tools that you can immediately apply. You'll learn how to be selective in executing the ideas that matter most, identify key ingredients of successful turnarounds, instill and reward virtues that accelerate teamwork, navigate cultural differences using the most effective methods possible, harness the power of emotional intelligence, and build cultures that value efficiency and effectiveness. The full lineup for our 2016 summit includes Melinda Gates, Alan Mullally, Bishop T.D. Jakes, Horst Schultze, Dr. Travis Bradbury, Aaron Meyer, Wilfredo De Jesus, Patrick Lencioni, Chris McChesney, Danielle Strickland, Jossie Chaco, John Maxwell, and myself. Everyone wins when a leader gets better. But what about when an entire team gets better? Independent research shows that 83% of leaders who attend consecutive years of the summit experience improved teamwork, increased job satisfaction, and greater productivity. Do whatever it takes to bring your entire team to the summit. And when you do, you'll find it has an exponential effect on your entire organization and you'll become more effective as a leader taking your organization from here to there. See you at the summit. So I just uh, three weeks ago, I was uh, in the main room with 7,000 others and 3,000 in the over overflow room. Uh, 10,000 on one site. It's pretty amazing, actually, but it's only in America. The car park is bigger than any supermarket car park that I have seen in New Zealand. It's seriously, it's enormous. Uh, but um, just to say that, um, uh, like always, some stunning uh, presentations. But for me, what stood out was um, uh, highballs always. Um, now, I'm no fan. I'm not really. I, I have always appreciated T.D. Jakes and uh, have followed him with some interest, but not closely. Don't read a lot of his material. But honestly, 72 years of age, and this interview that highballs does with T.D. is unbelievable, the, the, the um, leadership insights. Uh, so that's just priceless. Uh, Daniel Strickland, a stunning woman who is working in LA from Canada, working in LA, Salvation Army officer, brilliant. Uh, Joss, Jossie Chaco, actually, um, has, John, have you heard of Joss, Jossie? Yeah. So uh, he did a great talk, and we're going to have Jossie here in New Zealand in August next year, um, and he's going to do a short very quick tour uh, on um, 
leadership lessons from Asia. His work in India is phenomenal, and you'll learn a little bit about that if you come along. So um, you can register for uh, the summit at uh, willowcreek.org.nz. Great, thanks for that. So we now come to the star of the show. So uh, how many of you are on Family First's mailing list? How many of you read the, the uh, emails that uh, Bob sends out, mostly Bob sends out? Good, oh, that's a high percentage, Bob. Um, so uh, in my view, for what it's worth, I, you know, Christians and politics haven't done very well in New Zealand. Well, Christian parties haven't done very well in New Zealand. In fact, Christians and politics are not doing that well. I mean, there's a lot of Christians in politics, um, and it's, it's hard work. Uh, I, I am of the conviction that it's incredibly difficult to speak from within. Bob speaks from without, refuses to go into politics because he believes he's got a better voice outside to influence. And in my view, is the prophetic voice that represents us. They, there is no one else. Uh, uh, tell me if there is. Th there is no one else who the media listen to, um, I think reluctantly, but they listen to Bob. He's regularly on TV news and, of course, radio and other media outlets. And he speaks for us. He speaks in the language of the native, if you wish. doesn't speak Christianese, but he speaks for us in terms of the values and principles that we believe in and that we hold dear. So it's for that reason that we have Bob here. So would you welcome Bob to Taronga? I think it's been some time since he's been here. And um, So Bob's going to be back in Taronga. Do you know the date off the top of your head? No. I'll so, email you. Eh? I'll email you. So Bob's going to be back. Um, Bob's going to be back in Tauranga um, in November, I think it is, yeah. at St Peter's, yeah. and he's going to do a different kind of presentation. So this is different content to, or well, there'll be some crossover, but essentially different content to what he will do at a public meeting in um, November at St Peter's. So Bob, uh, great to have you here. Good mate, you're a soldier. Um, what got you into this work? Because um, many may remember you as a, a Radio Rima um, media personality. What got you into this work 10 years ago? T this year is uh, Family First 10th uh, anniversary. Um, well, spiritually speaking, Jeremiah says, I have a plan for you. It's a plan for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And basically, when you look back over what I've done, <clears throat> it's kind of been a preparation time, so I started as an accountant um, and qualified at Auckland Uni, uh, started lecturing and accounting at a tertiary institution, then I went into Youth for Christ, uh, running South Auckland Youth for Christ when Ian, was, Ian Grant was doing Auckland, um, then I set up a, a uh, youth organisation for at-risk families in Papatoi, um, then I went into radio, uh, radio has always been in my blood. <clears throat> in fact, I was on Mount Monganui Beach by the Surf Club Light um, uh, Clubhouse with a summer beach radio station back in late 80s. Um, so I've, it's radio's been in my blood. But um, and then I was four years on Radio Rima as their breakfast talkback host. Um, they decided to discontinue the program, so I was kind of like, "What do I do now?" But in fact, as Jeremiah revealed to me, the prophet Jeremiah, um, things sort of came together and the media training, the, the social work background and just the business management sort of perfect storm into um, creating Family First. And it was partly because in the media, I, at times, I used to struggle to find spokespeople on family issues. Uh, at the time, we had a strong little group in Parliament called United Future, and Maxim were very vocal, but it was hard outside of that to find a strong, coherent voice. So um, I guess I just dipped my toe in the water, and 10 years later. 
Fantastic, Bob. Talk a little bit about um, so a little bit about your own background there. What about uh, your family? Just uh, let the brothers and sisters know. Yep. So uh, Tina, um, my wife is uh, half Nuan, and I have um, three kids. Um, a daughter who's eighteen, who's just starting to train as a primary teacher. Um, a son who's fifteen, who supports Liverpool, and. Um, only because only because his father told him to, and a uh, eleven-year-old daughter who prefers netball. Um, and I'm, I live in I was born and raised in Papatoi, and I now live in Manurewa, but together with a guy called uh, Tavaki Tupo, who was previously the president of the Methodist Church, um, we came out of the Methodist Church and planted Papatoi Community Church in Papatoi. He passed away at the beginning of the year, unfortunately. But his legacy lives on. Um, he used to be at St. Stephen's. Mm. And that's where you still go as a family? Papatai yeah. Community Church, yeah. 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 And so even on this road trip, like this is presentation number 20 and I think I've got 48 to go, um, but I've really worked to be away just in blocks of three or four. Of, of, I, I have not taken engagements on Sunday mornings. I've said... I'm going to be with my family at my family church. There's no point in me going around preaching family first if I'm not doing it. And, um, you know, so I've got to set the example. Good on you. So, um, 10 incredible years, and uh, you've got a little bit of a, a video um, segment to just uh, show us Hopefully. what's been happening. Family First New Zealand has been speaking up for 10 years on issues that matter to your family. Here's a summary of just some of the many topics we've spoken about. The lobby group Family First is furious at this week's planned launch of the violent video game Grand Theft Auto. The game, among other things, allows players to buy cocaine, run over civilians in cars and shoot police officers. Uniforms aren't the only talking point. The guidelines also suggest addressing gender stereotypes and norms in school years one to three. Primary school kids are not thinking about gender identity and gender norms. The Advertising Standards Authority has banned an internet mana party video that includes crowds chanting expletives aimed at the Prime Minister. Family First complained about the video which was posted on YouTube but was classed an adver advertisement for internet mana. Family First has been fighting the law since its 2007 inception. It's now armed with a legal opinion from public lawyer Mei Chen, saying good parents are being criminalised. Their faces are becoming familiar, and the reaction of horror is always the same. Now campaigners want everyday people to stand up and be counted. But some see the idea of a kid's hotel as a convenient way out for parents who put their own lives or career first. If Johnny turns up to school deciding that he wants to be a girl for that day, does that mean that he uses the girls' toilets, he changes with the girls before PE, and he plays in the girls' soccer team? That's, that's a recipe for a confusion. It is five to seven. I wonder if the kids have already got their heads down onto iPads and iPods and the rest of it this morning, because your children apparently are risking their health by spending too much time glued to TVs and devices. Well, that's the claim in a new report by a Family Values Lobby Group. Family First says the court's decision is a disgrace. We have deemed in our legal system that the right of the pornography industry to advertise on a main street is more important than the right of families to be protected. Family breakdown and decreasing marriage rates are costing New Zealand taxpayers at least $1 billion. A new report commissioned by Family First shows even a small reduction in the family breakdown and increase in marriage rates could mean a significant savings for taxpayers. It's the flick that's been billed as a supernatural tale of mental illness, bondage, incest, revenge and explicit graphic violence. Not exactly family viewing, right? Well, definitely not, says Family First. They've already called for the film Wound to be banned. But Family First New Zealand, which advocates for strong families and safe communities, says there is no place for topless sunbathing on our public beaches. I think it's totally wrong to do that. What about the calls from uh, Family First, which have come out this morning from Bob McCroskery, about the right to silence law? But first, sex and school. 
we go back to the classroom to learn what kids are learning about sex. We're just saying, hey, look, it's just a physical act. As long as you wear the condom, you can basically get away with anything. Because there are parts of it, I mean, we're talking sex, violence, drugs, aren't it's we? It's explicit, but though, and I'd like to read extracts from the book to you, but we can't on air. Really says to our young people is that you're rich, you're famous, you can get away with anything. E kōrero wana a Beva Dea Beats mō te tono a Chris Brown ki te uru mai ki Aotearoa. Unfortunately, in terms of the, some of the nasty things on the internet, the horse has bolted, unfortunately, and so it's putting some safeguards in place. So discuss it with your kids. If they do come across some of this dodgy stuff, talk about it. I, I don't think we can avoid it anymore because it is, it's just the nature of the internet now. If we really worked hard to make this a family event, this is not an angry march. This is not a group of people who are angry. We just want democracy, don't we? Because we love our kids. We love our families. It's almost four years since babies Chris and crew Kahui were killed. Now, Family First says an anonymous donor has offered $25,000 to see justice served. Hi there, I'm Simon Barnett, and a very proud dad of four beautiful girls. In the next 90 seconds, let me explain to you what the referendum on the anti-smacking law is all about. Joining me now is Bob McCoskey uh, from Family First in the studio and women's health doctor Carol Shand. One, two, three, four, three, four, three, four. Others were outraged. One, two, three, A lobby group gathered 300,000 signatures which forced the citizens' referendum. I want to know why the law and why people aren't going over the real perpetrators like the, with um, Nia Glassie and Coral Burrows and, um, and the Kahui Twins. We've now got a number of things kicking in. We've got uh, increased uh, mortgage rates. We've got GST yep, uh, yep. kicking in shortly. Family First have um, released a survey. It's called Young People and Alcohol, and of course the, the, the alcohol reform bill is, is something that's going to be kicking over this mm. year. A lobby group Family First is urging the government to vote against the marriage amendment bill that would allow gay marriage at a parliamentary select committee hearing today, the group presented a petition with more than 70,000 signatures of people who want marriage to remain between a man and a woman. If you change the definition, and this is a question I want to ask Louisa, is once you change the definition once, what stops you changing it again? I mean, if you, you, don't, if you take away the regulation of gender, why not the regulation of, ge of number? Groups from the other side would say that you just don't understand child poverty, you don't understand inequality, you've forgotten what it's like to be poor, yep. you live in Parnell, yep. you know, have you forgotten? No. The argument is once you redefine something, where do you stop? I mean, what's wrong with three consenting adults who want to get married, or four? When Family First launched a Protect Marriage website today, the website was attacked by hackers, it's still down, and its creator received nearly a hundred hate emails. You're back with Q&A and uh, the panel, Raymond Miller, Bob McCroskey and Anton Blunk. Gay adoption? Uh, no, because I think a child right, Raymond deserves Miller. a mum and a dad. A divorce made easy website has been launched today. The site says it can help reduce the cost of a marriage breakup. It says there's no need for sizeable legal fees or solicitors dragging out the divorce process. The Christian lobby group Family First says the concept is both tacky and destructive. Well, they are confused. I mean, uh, what that question actually showed was that 3% couldn't figure out what the agenda was. And I think most people would raise their eyebrows and say, well, surely you know what your biological sex is. Joining me now is Dr. Miriam Grossman, a psychiatrist from the States who writes about the harm of sex education. She's been brought out here by Family First. I don't think the question is, uh, when do we begin sexuality education? The actual question is who does a sexuality education. So you agree that it should start when kids are five? No, my argument is simply that parents determine what kids need to know at the suitable times. And when does a child, unborn child have a right to life? At what point in their life? Well, you speak biologically, life begins from the very start. Conception. Yeah. Uh, if I send my child to school and they've got different shoes to what the school says or, or they want to go on a trip to the zoo, I've got to sign a note. But when it comes down to a serious medical procedure like an abortion or what to do with an unwanted pregnancy, suddenly I can be excluded from that situation and my child can be sneaked off. I'm on Guy Holland's team and I need you to vote for us because we need to equip and encourage parents to step up to the mark and be the best parents they can in New Zealand. And I think Job Description 101 for parents is a roof, a shelter for your kids and food for your kids. Alright, very powerful stuff. Thanks very much, Bob. 
Family Firsts making no apologies for a report that claims too many New Zealand children are spending too long in daycare. Katahi naiti nairi poata munga mama nga punatsia ki tamariki mi te uranga o te tamaiti kariwa. The Family First organisation says there have been 10 suspicious child deaths in the past 17 months. That's these seven children and three other newborns. That's why we want an independent watchdog, because I think when social workers are making crucial decisions, uh, often subjective judgments based on the information at hand, then they need a independent watchdog that ratifies what they've done, gives the public confidence. Family First says it's written to New Zealand booksellers asking them to steer clear of the title. But what these groups are doing is shutting down any image of a father feeding a child, and I think that's a great image that we need on TV, at the same time as saying, breast is best. She'll vote next month at the local church where she still teaches Bible class. Education, she says, is vital, and it leaves no excuse for young people not to vote. Hi, so meet New Zealand's longest married couple, um, Jerem and Gunja Rubji, have been married for 81 years, 81. What is the purpose of adoption? Okay, let me ask you a specific question, Bob. And I'm saying there are Bob. plenty of children that need love, and we shouldn't Yeah, and they also need gender complementarity. They want the mum and the dad. Family First is this morning publishing legal advice around catering for transgender students at school. The lobby group claims schools are being bullied into adopting gender identity policies, and they need guidance. I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone seriously thought that was going to help this problem that we've got with child abuse. Uh, Bob, thank you very much for joining us. Bob McCoskey, uh, Family First New Zealand National director uh, and the figures are there they're anti-smacking law complete complete waste of time join our campaign to protect families be informed be equipped to speak up support this important work visit familyfirst.nz One man who is willing to go where angels fear to tread. Well done, Bob. Um, you know, just uh, such a multiplicity of issues. So before we get into a few of the uh, pressing issues of the day, how do you determine what you're going to... I mean, you speak intelligently and knowledgeably about so many of these issues. How do you determine what one you're going to really, you know, uh, push and promote? Could you tell my wife that? She needs to hear that. She does. I, I'll be happy to but tell. I'm Tina, no problem. Knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, look, to be honest, uh, what I've realised is that the media and society, but the media especially, think in a vacuum, a, a very short window of time, 24 to 48 hours. And you know the old saying that today's news is tomorrow's fish and chip wrapper. That's how they think. So it's simply uh, striking while the iron's hot. So three weeks ago, if you had emailed the Prime Minister about Easter trading and giving his MPs a conscience vote, he would have failed it. Because we did a campaign in the 48 hours before the vote, the media made him respond to that challenge. So, um, you know, some, some people say, I have a media release out before they've even got out of I news. say that. You say that, that's right. I'm the one who says, Bob, we get up at 5 or 5.30 and Bob's already got a media release out. <laughs> I, I've just learned in media that you've got to strike while well, I've been in media. I guess that's, that's part of the um, preparation ground that God's given me is that I know how the other side works. And I know what they're thinking. And I know the type of media releases that they will just laugh at and just immediately bin and the ones that they'll take notice of. So I guess, I'll, yeah, that, that's, that's part of the Jeremiah. I so plans. all the issues <clears throat> in some way link back to the protection of the nuclear family as we know it, the traditional family that also the Bible, of course, uh, outlines very clearly. Yeah, I really, uh, I think the yardstick is what are families concerned about? And if an issue comes up and families are concerned about it, then I will, um, you know, comment on it if I'm asked about it or maybe be um, go out there first and make a comment about right. it, uh, research issues. Um, but yeah, there's some issues, I mean the media do try to track me um, and they want to paint me in a certain way. So for example, I got rung up about Bernice Meni who's you know the ex-netball captain who um, posed, she, she was pregnant and she posed naked for Women's Weekly. That's how they rang, rang me and told me about it. So I said, well, tell me more about the picture. Well, in fact, what it was was actually a, a beautiful photo of a pregnant woman, but no, nothing um, 
pornographic about it. And so I said, sounds like a beautiful photo to me. Kajunk, <laughs> phone hung up. <laughs> Didn't get the response they wanted. So they are trying to bait you at times and they're trying to paint you. And um, I think I've, worked, I've tried to work really hard to avoid just being a moral cop on issues below the belt, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's why I've talked about things like poverty, child poverty, and drinking age, and uh, all those issues that are outside that typical right-wing moral. Yeah. Domain. So let's take Easter trading, Easter Day trading. Oh, good! It's Good Friday and Easter, isn't it? That, yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, so you've been quite vocal on that uh, a couple of times now. Yeah. Um, why that issue? Well, because it's about family time, it's about tradition. Um, some people say, look, it's only because it's a relig ho religious holiday and I've just shot back at them immediately. No, we don't think Anzac Day should be changed either. In fact, our argument is that we should have more public holidays. If you look at some overseas countries like the United States, uh, they've got a number of public holidays. So mm. um, it's, it's not less, it's more. Um, they've only changed Easter Sunday, which is interesting. Which, but all they've done is they've opened the gate wide for East Good Friday and Christmas Day, will they touch Anzac Day? Possibly not, because they that's worshipped, but the others can't be worshipped. So it's, yeah, that's the irony of it. Mm. Just bef again, talk mm. to us about, so what are you, what, what's the news feeds that you're reading? Where are you getting your, uh, you know, because you need to read fast, you need to read summaries uh, with the multiplicity of issues, particularly in the last, you know, 10 years since you've started. So what are you reading? Where's it coming from? And that might be helpful to some of the pastors here. Yeah, um, well, I think in terms of helpful to you, I do it for you. Uh, and so one thing that I did at REMA for four years was when I got to work at 5 a.m., I spent an hour researching and reading, and I've just carried on that habit. So every morning for an hour before I take my dog for a walk, I, I basically go through every national and international newspaper and read it. Online, obviously. Online, all mm. online. Um, and um, sift through the bias and figure out what the facts are. Um, and a lot of people forward me good articles, etc. So I'm forever reading. I've got this reading list. You know, I've got a couple of papers on my passenger door at the moment that I, that I need to read. Um, and, and the idea is on our website is to post up these stories and some people get our daily update, which it has family-based stories with our comment, and um, you know, if there's a big issue, we send it out, or if we put out a media release related to it. Yeah, and I'd commend the website. It's such a useful resource uh, for pastors and uh, preachers when it comes to being well informed about, uh, you know, talking on topical issues. Um, it's a fantastic uh, website. I just want to, just with the anti-smacking thing, I just to, I'm just seeing Larry sitting here, and of course Larry did a fantastic job in terms of trying to really get New Zealanders um, mobilised to vote against it. Um, so, um, what was the size of your petition, Larry? Um, I mean, you and uh, Barbara pretty much single-handedly pulled that off. It was a stunning effort. So Larry just saying 87% of the country agreed. Um, I actually believe that the majority of New Zealanders will come up with better answers than the politicians. Mm. And we should not be afraid of their views. Mm. Um, because their losing the battle. Bob, Bob, you do a fantastic job here. Mm. You do. But we've lost every battle we could because we either have to have people inside Bulldog for mayor. Um, no, no, don't make him mayor because when we get binding referendum, I'm going to employ him to go out and get 300,000 signatures again <laughs> <laughs> on a couple of issues. Yeah. Smacking, parental notification, marriage, <laughs> euthanasia. <laughs> um, so, um, so Larry referenced something that I was going to come to later, Bob, but let's do it now since he touched on it, which is that it is a battle and you're not winning too many. Well, that's unfair to say you're not winning too many. We're not winning too many. The traditional view, this mainstream that Larry touched on and that he clearly coalesced back however many years ago, we're not winning. 
and, and, and it seems like mainstream New Zealanders who believe in, I think, oftentimes the values that you and I believe in as Christians, but uh, roll over very easily, it seems. Um, what's, how do you feel about that? Another loss, another loss. Um, we did this um, at the beginning of the year. The board got together and we got out a whiteboard and we said, let's make a list of all our victories and our wins. Uh, it was blank. We, we haven't won something where we could celebrate, I guess, apart from our court case regarding deregistration, which we're coming back to. Yeah. But, um, no, we haven't won. But what we realised is that um, we're not actually called to win. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that you're called to win. We are called to speak truth. And we won't win every battle, but we'll lose every battle we don't even show up to. And my, my suggestion is that we're losing a whole lot of battles because we are the silent majority. We aren't speaking up. Um, and take, for example, the marriage debate. What they won't tell you, well, euthanasia debate. Let me tell you about the euthanasia debate. They've got this inquiry, 20,000 submissions, right? What the media won't tell you is that the analysis shows that three quarters of them are against euthanasia. They won't tell you that. The marriage debate. When the marriage debate first started, gay marriage, two to one were for it, right? On the weekend before the final vote, the, the New Zealand Herald ran a poll and it was 50-50. The country was split. We were winning that debate. That's why they threw out 20,000 submissions and ran that through in six months, because they knew it would not get through. And that's why the Australians do not want to... Well, the, 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 the Liberal elite do not want a referendum on it, because th there, there, there is a common sense, but mm. common sense is being parked and it's being and muted, and, it, and common sense is being called names. You're being called bigoted and, and transphobic and hater, and I'm so we, and we go quiet. Because no one likes to be yeah. called a name. No. Um, so, Bob, let's just uh, talk a little bit about um, the uh, whole registration issue. Uh, the Charities Commission are after you again. Um, they're starting another sort of effort to uh, deregister you yeah. as a charity. Um, just bring people up to date on that. Yeah, so um, they tried to deregister us. We appealed in the High Court. We won our case. The judge basically said to the Charities Commission, doesn't matter what you think of their view, that's not for you to determine. You're supposed to judge whether they're a charity and whether they're of public benefit and whether there's public support. So it's gone back to them. They're having another shot at us. And I think they're just hoping for a different judge. But this is, um, this is the reason that they say that we should be deregistered. The board considers that Family First has a main purpose to promote the view that the natural family, defined by the trust as a union of a man and a woman through marriage, is the fundamental social unit. What's the problem with that? The board considers that the trust's opinions are fairly described as controversial in contemporary New Zealand society. And so for that reason, Family First should be deregistered. Now, I don't need um, registration, to be honest. I mean, it's handy sending out receipts to our supporters and letting them get a third back, but at the end of the day, that's not going to mute me. But I'm going to fight this to the death, and I'm, I'll be taking them back to court, so I'm just waiting for them to tell me they're proceeding, because I'll just instruct the lawyers straight back to court. Because if they succeed against us, yeah. they will then come under after other nutters, like you, who have controversial views in contemporary New Zealand society. And to be honest, I already see a little bit of the writing on the wall because already on tax forms they have separated out donations into church donations and non-church donations. Why would they do that? So I'm saying <laughs> to pastors wherever I can, now that this issue is warming up again, is here's something that we can tangibly do to actually help the cause. It's going to help us. If we can throw a few bucks at uh, this legal battle, then that's a good thing to do. And so if I could just uh, make that comment. It's very easy to donate. Uh, to Family First on, on, on their website, and uh, it's, I, I'd encourage you to do that. Because it is our battle, isn't it? Yeah. This is not just Bob's battle, it is ours. So, well, it's, uh, it's always dangerous when the state determines what is acceptable exactly. thought and what is not acceptable exactly. thought. That, that's yeah. dangerous. And Marcus Lush int uh, interviewed me once and said, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, why shouldn't they deregister you? And I said, Marcus, you may totally disagree with us, but what about when you have some charity that you love you love their messaging, and they're being deregistered by the government of the day because the government disagrees with their views. 
It, it was a bit of a wake-up call. We hadn't thought of it like that. Mm, I bet you. So, Bob, let's talk about a couple of issues. And, and by the way, there is going to be an opportunity for some quick questions uh, very shortly from you. Uh, but uh, let's just talk about the whole issue of marriage as we understand it. And you have uh, come out very strongly uh, and, and have said that there is a strong link between the decline of marriage and so many other social problems that we face in New Zealand, uh, especially those to do with children. Uh, so could you elaborate a little bit on that? And I know you've got a few um, graphs to help us uh, understand this. Yeah, so basically my message that I'm travelling around the country saying is that strong marriage foundation leads to strong families, leads to a strong nation. But in New Zealand what we're seeing is a weakening of marriage and therefore we're seeing a weakening of family and we're seeing social cost. And so uh, it's based on the Malachi principle of, you know, the prophet Malachi, final verse of the Old Testament, identified that family breakdown leads to negative outcome when there is a breakdown in that relationship. And so my presentation, which you can see in full if you come to St. Peter's, <clears throat> is that for as our marriage rate has declined, we have seen an increase in negative social areas, and I highlight a number of those. But just to give you a quick outline, in 1961, 95% of kids were born to a married couple. By last year, it was just half of our kids are born into a family where mum and dad are married. For, Mar for Maori, it was 72%. It is now one in five that are um, born into a family where there's marriage. Now, people say there's sole parent families, and you've probably got sole parent families in your church, and we need to support them. You know, God is a father to the fatherless. We acknowledge that. But we have one of the highest rates of solo parent families in the OECD, and it's exacerbated by New Zealand Maori and New Zealand Pacific. And there is a huge proportion of these one-parent families who are doing it really tough, and I take my hat off to these solo, solo parents, and every solo parent I talk to says, Bob, this is not the way I wanted it, and, you know, they're not celebrating it. They're actually saying it is really tough. But there's a, a fatherlessness problem. Um, and there is a, a, you know, a lack of dads. And even Barack Obama, who grew up without a dad, acknowledges that he suffered because of the absence of dad. Now, the, just the one other thing is that we also have one of the highest increases in terms of cohabitation, of couples living together. Maybe you've got them in your church. Uh, we've got a couple in my church, and, and I've said to them, you've got to get married. Okay? It, it's important. Why? Because the research shows that there is, a, there is a stickiness about marriage. In the Christchurch development study, cohabitation is a foremost risk factor for breakdown of a child's family in its first five years. The chance of mum and dad splitting up is four times higher if mum and dad are just living together as opposed to if they are married. So there is a stickiness factor, and that's backed up by research in the US and the UK. And so I cover this in more depth um, in my talk, but I really, I really promote and say, look, marriage isn't perfect, and marriage isn't perfect because people are involved, and anything that people are involved in ain't perfect. But if you look at the research and the evidence, it is by far the strongest model to hold together families and, and keep them strong. Mm. So, yep, yeah, so, yeah, that'd be good to have another amen or two, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, amen, amen. So, Bob, so here we are, a bunch of Christian leaders, um, and uh, we, as pastors, um, up and down the land, we are, we're, there are marriages falling over every year. Um, as some pastors report to me that, I've got one at the moment, we must have about four marriages that are very frail in a larger church. Um, and uh, somebody close to my, one of my boys, it looks like that's going to fall over. What do, uh, and they're Christians, what, what would your recommendation be in terms of what we can do as pastors and um, ministry leaders proactively to hold on to our, uh, to, to encourage our youngsters to stay together? Well, let me, uh, firstly, let me show you just some examples of why marriage makes a difference in terms of what we're seeing in society because I think, uh, like Child Poverty Action Group put out a report on child poverty and in it they basically said marriage is an antiquated, it's been romanticised, it's patriarchal and it's just not relevant. Uh, that's, that's the way they think. Um, but the interesting thing is that when you look at what effect marriage is having in our community, it actually is having good results. I mean, this, 
This child poverty, we put out a child poverty report a couple of months ago by a researcher from Wellington who specialises in welfare issues. Now, whenever you talk about child poverty, what do the media say or what do the uh, reports say? They say, we've just got to increase employment, we've got to have a living wage, we've got to sort out housing costs, we've got to increase benefits. But what this report found, examining government statistics, was that the elephant in the room that nobody will talk about is family structure. Family structure and the forming of families and whether the families have stuck together is the biggest driver determinant of a family living in poverty. For example, 51% of kids in poverty come from solo parent homes where there is increased stress. I mean, even solo parents will say it is that much harder. So it, it carries out. Now here's um, another example, child abuse. There's two interesting things about this. I'll highlight it on this screen. Maori rate. 15% of the population, 54% of all child abuse. Now, I do not for one minute believe that the Maori are a violent culture. I would argue that the reason that Maori have a disproportionate child abuse rate is because they have very low marriage rates, they have high solo parent rates, high teenage pregnancy. Because of that, they're much more likely to live in poverty and for that reason, they are stressed. And this is just a manifestation of, of fractured families that aren't doing well. Contrast that with uh, Asian. 9% of the population, 1% to 2% of child abuse. Why? Very high marriage rates, strong family identity, strong community identity. You have no, you know, you are, Asians are like that, aren't they? They're very, they're very, very close-knitted. And just one other thing, there's been about four reports written about the causes of child abuse. They all say the same thing. They all highlight drug and alcohol abuse. In other words, a child's hugely at risk when mum and dad are wasted, stoned, off their face, drunk, violent, right? Don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. And yet here we are dallying with liberalising drug laws and being weak and lily need on alcohol laws, right? But then the next three, family breakdown, poverty, and violence in the home. And the SIF report quoted this one that children living in households with an adult unrelated 50 times more likely to die of child abuse than a child living with its biological parents. Now the politicians read those reports and came up with the anti-smacking law. And of course the research shows that nothing has improved, not a single area has improved in terms of child abuse since that law was passed. They have all got worse. All got worse. If you don't believe me, I'll give you a copy of the report before we leave. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. But it's because the doctor isn't di hasn't diagnosed the problem, so can't heal the problem. And so we have to start speaking up about this drug and alcohol abuse, but also about family structure and encouraging formation of families. We, we need to be with our young people talking about marriage, promoting strong marriages, saying that there's a stickiness, make wise decisions and supporting families where there is breakdown. For marriages, we've got, yeah, we've got to get that pre-marriage counselling and we've got to get that support for married couples in our churches because, as we all know, we're humans involved. It's tough. I um, have just been, this week, involved on a panel to recruit a new policeman for Raglan uh, <coughs> in my role in the community board, and it was fascinating that one of the inspectors that was on the panel uh, works uh, in the SIFS office, so she's uh, one of the... Um, uh, child abuse um, yes. uh, investigators. Mm. And uh, I said to her at, at lunch, I said, um, is SIPs overwhelmed? Are they, are they overwhelmed? Is it just so many notifications? Is it just, are they? She says, absolutely. Mm. They, they, do, they are <coughs> so overwhelmed mm. with uh, the uh, uh, number of notifications on abuse. Um, and, and so here we, you know, we, uh, I mean, honestly, I, and I can't believe that in a country like New Zealand we have this problem. And most of us are sheltered from it. Uh, my, one of my sons and my wife work deep in a decile one community. They face it just about every day. Pastoral work for my wife is at the prison, police station, at the psych unit, and at probation, <laughs> pretty much, um, because of uh, violent outbreak. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I actually believe that here is a tremendous uh, opportunity for the Christian church to respond to because we, we believe in peace and we worship the Prince of Peace. Yeah. It's, uh, 
Right. Well, we're coming to the end. I, I want to tackle uh, with you um, what I think is one of the, perhaps for me, and I think about my grandchildren, um, most of whom are little girls, um, this gender identity thing and this gender fluidity thing, this what they call now we're amorphous, is that the word that they're using? Um, I can't imagine a day that my um, daughter, a granddaughter, is going to be in a school where uh, you pick which bathroom you're going to go to, but we're heading that way, I believe. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, sure. I think this is a really crucial issue, uh, and I talk about this in more detail at the talk, but uh, let me just show you a couple of slides to show you what is being pushed. To be honest, if Bruce Jenner wants to become Caitlyn Jenner, so be it. But the problem I have is when this ideology is pushed in our schools, which it is, to kids as young as five. And in fact, in Australia, it's being pushed in preschools, yep. Yeah, okay. So this is, I, I think, what I want to do is just explain very briefly what is being pushed, because I think that a lot of us just aren't aware. So let me show you just a couple of things. Firstly, this is the ideology. It's slightly crude. Sorry about that, David, in your church. But this is the ideology. Sex is what's between your legs, gender is what's between your ears. That is what young people are being told. And apparently the two can be separate. And so you have this um, message um, pushed, this is a Rainbow Youth one, where you can be male, you can be female, you can be both, you can be neither, or you can swap between the two. And it's just said completely normal. Uh, and so you have the media pushing this thing and this statement born into a girl's body. So you've got a transgender girl wanting to live as a boy and she was accidentally, you know, it's accidentally born into a girl's body. And the media just say that without any question. And then the PPTA, which is supposed to represent the educators of this country, say gender identity refers to what a person thinks of as their own gender, whether they think of themselves as a man or a woman, irrespective of their biological sex. Um, the Ministry of Education wants kids as young as five to be taught stuff like this. When I was five, all I cared about was what had mum given me for lunch and who I was gonna play with at playtime. Um, the Human Rights Commission says that children have a right, as young as five, to use a changing room, play in the sports team, and even share bunk rooms on school camps that match their identity not their biological sex. And yet the research shows that the overwhelming majority of kids grow out of their gender dysphoria by the time they reach puberty. And why? Because nature confirms their biological sex. <laughs> you know, um, And yet what we're doing is we're, we're saying, no, your, your idea that you want to be a tomboy is completely normal. In fact, we'll help you change your sex. I can send you these slides if you, if you want. And people will label us as hateful and bigoted and transphobic for questioning this whole agenda. But as I say there, it is neither enlightening or loving to pretend that we can just let our children decide which gender they want to be. It's ideological. It is not biologically based. There is no scientific basis for it. Uh, there's a paper released just last week by two um, uh, psychiatrists from John Hopkins University mm. Um, and one of them is actually pro-LGBT community, and yet he says there is no scientific basis for gender change, uh, and the professionals don't recommend it. He, Paul McHugh, one of the writers of the paper, says this. I think this is the best statement. Gender dysphoria is not a problem of the body, but the mind. Cutting at the body does not do a great deal to heal the mind. We psychiatrists would do better to concentrate on trying to fix their minds and not their genitalia. Now you think about the comparison. You've got a young girl in your youth group who has anorexia nervosa. She thinks she's fat, she's starving herself until she is skinny. She still thinks she's fat and so she keeps starving herself until the fact that she almost kills herself, she harms herself physically, right? What do we do? Do we go to her and say, yeah, no, you're right, you're fat, and uh, look, I'll get some scissors, let's cut off a bit of this extra fat around your hips. Of course not. We get counselling, don't we? We get the mental help for the anorexia nervosa. So anorexia nervosa is a disorder, but gender dysphoria 
is an identity. Could you just, dysphoria, you used the word quite freely, just yeah. to explain that. Gender I... dysphoria is, is basically, it, it believes the, the, what you perceive is different to the physical reality. Uh, there's another one called xenom xenomelia, I think it is, where you actually feel that uh, there are limbs on your body that you don't want, mm -hmm. and so you try and remove them. So it's a, it's a, it's a mental disorder. Yeah, it's a delusion. Yeah, dysphoria. You know, um, and and so, um, so they so they are tackling it like that. And so, but the media are pushing it as well. The Dominion Post had this article two weeks ago, and it opened with this statement: When she was 15, a girl deposited her sperm. And apparently, you have read that in the newspaper, so you take it as factual. No analysis of it. No questioning. I mean, it's obviously false. She did not deposit her sperm. He deposited his sperm, he just identifies as a she. But these kinds of statements are now normalised and your view that um, your biological sex is your gender, so they're the same thing intertwined, is now deemed to be not normal. You're mm. the bigot, the transphobe hater. You're the deluded. You're the deluded, yeah. And, and to be honest, I think it's just because common sense people, I mean, anybody see the front page of the Herald today? Apparently this taxpayer should be paying for taxpayer for gender change operations. Um, so the media are pushing this narrative. It's been pushed at our kids. What, what Bruce Jenner wants to do with his body is ultimately up to him. I, I wish he'd just get counselling. But your kids in your church and youth groups are being pummeled with this message and it is vital. And if you don't know where to start, then I would encourage you to download this report that was written by Glenn Stanton from Focus on the Family off our website and read it. It's compulsory reading if you're thinking, I just don't get my head around this, because it's one of, I, I, I mean, I sort of helped him write it and I made sure that it was pastorally focused, that it comes from a loving perspective and says, it's not judgmental or condemning or mocking. Um, it also has an article at the back by Walt Heyer, who was born a male, transitioned and had sex change operations to become a female and then went back to male and now runs a website called sexchangeregret.com and I'm tr I want to get him to New Zealand. He's a great guy um, and um, you know, he just says, as the research shows, and the whole reason John Hopkins University shut down the sex change clinic was because it didn't solve the problem. And of course it doesn't solve the problem. You're trying to deny biological reality. So I think, uh, and I talk about this in more detail with my talk, and I'm really trying to alert parents as to it and challenge what's being pushed in schools and preschools. Um, and I'd actually be interested to talk to you just a little bit more about that because I'd like some evidence. Um, so, yeah, download that because it is a big issue and your kids are getting pummeled with it. Yeah, it's a great read. Um, and, um, uh, and I, you know, it, it's probably one thing that actually is keeping me awake at night in terms of for my grandchildren's well-being. I mean, I'm just, it's just, it's a frightening new trend and, and reality that we're now facing. My, my instinct is, and I've been talking to some Christian um, educators in New Zealand, uh, that my instinct is there's going to be an upswing, actually, uh, in Christian education of different kinds. Homeschooling, uh, which I've been dead against, actually, personally, for years, but I'm probably <laughs> more supportive for it now than I've ever been. Uh, Christian schools, they're going to be harder to get started under the current government regime and probably the f in the future, but there are options. And uh, Graham Preston, by the way, is working with a group of very senior educators, Christian educators in New Zealand and Australia around this. And um, it's going to be interesting to see, so, um, you know, for what it's worth. So, Bob, thank you. Um, can I just underscore something? Bob, one of the things that I hear a little bit about uh, Family First and Bob in particular is that he, is, he sort of is just shoots from the hip and, and, and says these wild statements and it embarrasses Christians. Listen, I, 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 has anyone been embarrassed here today? Has Bob been shooting from the hips? Bob is factually based, well-read, and never shoots from the hip. And so uh, it's it, it, one of the, I'm just, um, Bob probably won't say this, but Bob has some difficulties in relationship, his relationship with, family first relationship with the, with the local church, the evangelical sector of the church. And I, 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 I'm sad about that. I am very, very sad about that. And it's probably evidenced a little bit by the numbers here. Um, that when Bob's around, people just don't want to be identified. And, and I picked that up. And, and Bob picks it up, and it hurts. And it hurts me because I think 
for me, tell me if I'm wrong, I think it's a prophetic voice. Without honour. I think in fairness, um, part of the problem is the media... Yeah, it doesn't help. ...want to paint me as a whack job. And as you can see, if the fact that they can put that in a sentence and not even blink shows that they'll be quite willing to paint me in a negative light. And a lot of people judge family first on the way we're presented in the media. And uh, I spend a lot of time trying to educate people that no longer is the media the fact presenter. It's now the opinion presenter. An entertainer. Yeah, and you've, you, you know, you just cannot, you've got to read through a filter anything uh, media-wise now. So we've got to, that's another thing that I think we've really got to teach our churches yeah, totally. is to be discerning in, as to what media is saying. So good, so good, Bob. Yeah. Some quick questions. We've just got a few more minutes. If you need to go, feel, feel free to go, please. We did say 12, uh, 1.15 if you need to go, but just a couple of quick questions, anybody? Uh, questions only, please, no, no sermons. Um, thank you. Oh. Yeah, I know. That's why I said it. That's why I said it, brother. I, you know, I've been around pastors long enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and politicians. Yeah. Point of order. <laughs> uh, you mean paid staff? Uh, so there's me and I've got two half-time ladies who sort of do uh, social, just loading of websites and my ad admin in the background. And um, then I've got a, a board and then I've, I've basically got sort of expert advisors around the country in various capacities. Uh, and in fact, one of them is Sandra Patterson, who she comes here, eh? Um, she was in here coming today. But, you know, so, yeah, the, there's advisors. Uh, and you have how many on your database, um, Bob? Um, so when I send out an email, it goes to 25,000. Um, and then we've got about 11,000 followers on Facebook. I mean, you never know. People probably could be deleting it and stuff. But there seems to be a level of engagement. Um, and I think it's really important that, uh, especially if politicians are coming up with wacky ideas or dumb bills, that they know that there's going to be a pushback. I want them to think twice and think, yeah. are we going to get pushback from this? Mm. Uh, for too long, they've just sat and said, yeah, let's do it, we're going to get away with it. Mm. And they probably still do, to a certain extent. Um, we, we Just one quote I do just want to uh, show you is this one from Billy Graham who said, courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. This is not about me, this is about you. When you take a stand, you stiffen the spines of others around you. And I think a lot of people are scared to speak up, and I think churches have been scared to speak up, to be honest, because we don't like being called hateful and bigots and homophobes and transphobes and every other phobes that there is. And, and you know, with the euthanasia debate, we don't like being... Uh, I mean, they are, they are really pummeling the religious opposition to euthanasia. But, Bob, just on that, mm. the, the Medical Council's against euthanasia, isn't it? Yes, the yeah, and the So this is really interesting. The, yeah, the Medical mm, Council is against And the disability it. groups. There you go. So that's fascinating, yeah. you know. So, but, but they're deliberately making that mm. all opposition is just religious nut jobs like you. And why are they doing that? Because they want you to shut up. Because they think that you don't like those labels and and you'll, you'll be, go quiet. And to be honest, I think they've been successful on a lot of issues. Mm. And I think we've, we've got to take a stand and stiffen the spines of others. Anybody else? Sorry, yeah, my friend. Yeah, it is going to be a local issue. Um, I mean, Larry, who is uh, standing for mayor, this is endorsed by Larry Baldock, um, uh, is um, yeah 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 yeah. But that's a that's a hundred dollar donation to. Um, no, um, I mean a lot of uh, saying that you know maybe local councils should referendum on this issue and find out the opinion. My, a lot of councils are really nervous about this because um, whatever law they pass, they all the government's done is taken the cost from them and they've said government the local council has to uh, come up with the law cost enforce it cost, compliance, cost, prosecute, cost, um, and it's just like the prostitution law and street prostitution and residential brothels. It is, is just a government's way of not tackling moral issues and sidekicking it. This vote was a whip. Anybody else? Mm. Right, and it's you. Nine out of 11. You and clout, that's not, eh? Anybody else? 
Okay. Well, Bob's going to be here for a little bit longer. Um, he's, I, I take it you're not rushing today, are you? No. Um, so I, I want to commend to you the meeting on, I think it's the 21st of November, if I recall. Um, I heard the nighttime talk last week in Palmerston. We were there together. And it's, uh, it, it just fills in a lot of more information. It's a heap of information. It's just a massive download. But um, if you can make it at some, to St Peter's on that day, I think Bob's just been looking it up, then that will be fantastic. David, I think it would be really appropriate uh, as we conclude that you, you come and pray for, for Bob. He is uh, our brother, and um, it's just together. Um, it's the uh, 16th of October, oh. 2 p.m. at St Peter's, 16th of October. Pardon me. Okay, so 16th of October. There you go. Can I defer to you on that? Yeah, sure. That's a great idea. We'd like to affirm over you, Bob, that uh, we, we've heard a message of hope. And uh, you're a pioneer. We speak that over you today. We don't just pray for you, but we, we lay hands on you and impart the Spirit of in God the of uh, that you would be a reinforcing within your spirit. We, we, we just don't want to pray, but we impart yeah. the Holy Ghost of God Ooh. to empower you and uh, continue yeah. to give you a vision and give you the stickability mm to stand against the powers of darkness. In Jesus' name, go from here today being yeah. refreshed, and every time you open your mouth, may you know that there is work being done for the kingdom of God's sake. We bless you and the work and the ministry. Be with your family, very yes, important. Uh, your wife and your children, watch over them, and uh, may you maintain the resilience that we sense that it was within you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.